Hi everybody, this is John Fiorella here to talk a little bit about the making of Grayson. And the uh, idea of doing this little commentary kind of came about halfway through production when I began selling various props and costumes on eBay so that I could afford to finance the rest of the film. And as a result of that, I received about seven dozen emails from filmmakers all over the planet asking all kinds of filmmaking questions. So I thought I'd answer a few of those questions. Starting with this shot right here, this is a golf course, and naturally I had no permits to shoot here. So I had to rustle up a group of trespassers who were willing to hop this wooden fence dressed in their finest threads, and uh, we rolled film. This was accomplished through forced perspective. The statue is really only 13 inches tall. It was something I just purchased and spray painted gray. And well, for the record, anything that remotely looks cool in this film has been spray painted to make it look that way. Here is the camera we filmed with. It's a Bolex. It's a great little wind-up camera about the size of a Mr. Coffee machine. And uh, while we shot on 16 millimeter, it's really this anamorphic lens that squeezes the frame into that Ben-Hur aspect ratio. And there's nothing fancy about the mount. Essentially, it's just a vise that holds the anamorphic lens in front of the camera lens. The reason for shooting Grayson with this rig was primarily because I had a lot of success with it in college. Uh, just making all kinds of silly films, beating up bad guys, kissing pretty girls, uh, which is why I would assume that most guys get into filmmaking for it in the first place. Um, it was in college also that I teamed up with Gabe Sabloff, who's just a really good friend and an amazing cinematographer. And Gabe does it all. He composes music, he's an incredible illustrator, and just having him behind the lens assures me that we're going to get the shot the way I envisioned it. Of course, that's easier said than done when you're producing and directing and working a full-time job. Sometimes the only way to shoot a scene is to break it down piece by piece. For example, every shot of the funeral scene involved us trespassing at a different golf course. In fact, during the shot where I look up, there's a groundskeeper hollering at us to get off the property, which is not the most ideal acting environment. One of the downsides of shooting with the anamorphic lens is that you can't do any tight close-ups, so in order to get as tight to the statue as I wanted, we had to build a bigger statue. And that was all Gabe. Gabe and $50 worth of clay. And to pull off the shot, we set the bust on a stool in a parking lot, and Gabe jumped in the trunk of my car, and I just pushed the car away from the subject. By the next day, the clay had dried and shriveled away any hopes I had of selling this thing on eBay, so we set it out on the sidewalk and smacked it with an axe, hoping, of course, that the glass gumball jar beneath it would explode into a million cool pieces. Yeah. Not exactly. This is my living room, which I painted brown for the film. Keep in mind that everything you see here I returned. The lamp, the picture frame, the plant, even the bookshelves, which to fill with books required three library cards and an afternoon spent arguing with librarians. Uh, the, this guy here is Mark Brocken, who is probably one of seven people in this town who's not an actor, though uh, he was really dedicated to do his best, and when you don't have any contracts, you're not paying any of your talent, you've got to have that level of commitment. And on top of that, he had the mustache, which saves me $8 in mustache costs, so naturally, he gets the part. You can see here I intended to move the camera on this shot. However, since the focus was so critical, I built the set on a furniture dolly and pushed it towards the camera. Uh, ultimately, the end result kind of looked like a pathetic zoom, so uh, I get an A for effort, but uh, I had to cut this up. Here's two weeks worth of knocking on doors in Beverly Hills so that I could film me walking through the gates. Of course, uh, there wasn't a lot of love to be had in this part of town, so we had to improvise. Ah, the wonderful uses of red electrical tape. We actually lit this entire film with three 1K lights, which can be plugged into any ordinary household circuit. Uh, of course, uh, if you want to create that beam of light, uh, you'll need a stronger source of power called the sun. And we achieved that beam by just simply propping a mirror up outside. Our dolly was this, uh, a little desk chair that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't. And this was the only scene we actually had to reshoot, and to Gabe's credit, was entirely my fault. My inspiration for this scene was Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, which had the costume in this black void, so Gabe uh, gave me exactly what I wanted, but when we saw the footage, it just didn't seem to fit. And uh, as for the case, I built that out of Lexan, which is kind of like plexiglass, only cheaper. And just like everything else, I pieced the costume together one layer at a time, and the uh, in-between stages were, um... Good lord, that's embarrassing. 
Uh, as far as the story goes, I think a lot of people tend to believe that Robin is only one rung above the Wonder Twins in the evolutionary chart of superheroes. However, for me, uh, whenever we played Super Friends in the front yard, uh, because I was the youngest of the group, I always got stuck playing Robin. And so in my little world, Robin kicks some serious butt. And as I got older, uh, the story I wanted to tell with this character evolved into something smarter and uh, in addition, something that wasn't about his origin. Uh, something instead that told a story that no one truly knew the outcome to. Um, keep in mind that while I know the chances of Warner Brothers uh, letting me make this movie are slim, I intentionally created the story around characters that were older and in no way conflicted with any of the Batman or Superman movies uh, currently in production. This way, if I score a meeting with the power players over at the studio and they get excited about this idea, then it's actually within the realm of possibility that it could get made. And once again, we're trespassing now at a construction site, and the uh, smoke was created by a $2 cigar puffed on by Mr. Christopher Burke, who uh, really helped us out on this film. We shot this at USC, and to acquire the location, I had the help of a USC film student who got permission to shoot the film under his name. And you'll notice how we could only light the very meat of the scene, but uh, that's what you get with three lights. Uh, these would be my storyboards, which I then send off to my pal Shane Donahue, who somehow deciphers my stick figures and redraws them into these little works of art. And he does them in record speed. I don't know how he does it. It's just Shane rocks. Paul Hassenjäger. I directed Paul in a commercial a few years earlier, and uh, shortly after that I cast him as Forrest Gregg of the Green Bay Packers for this Lombardi thing I directed. And Paul is a really fun guy to work with, and he always delivers when the camera rolls, and well, let's face it, uh, he makes one hell of a Superman. As for Batman, well, that's my cousin Jamie, uh, wearing a cowl a little too tight for comfort. Uh, and I'm being completely serious when I say that Jamie is in almost every other shot of the film. <laughs> he was a real good sport. Uh, this water was cold, and uh, he's lying on the cement being zipped up in my garment bag. Um, of course, from the right angle with the right light, uh, you got one dead superhero. Total, this trailer took 18 months to put together, uh, beginning August 2002. Three months of pre-production, 10 months of shooting, and five months of editing. Uh, reason being, we could only shoot on the weekends because everybody had jobs, and once we finished production, we could only get into the edit suite once everyone had left for the night. Um, though I think Gabe would agree, the most frustrating aspect of the whole production was that there were no dailies. I could only afford to develop and transfer the footage every three months, which rattles the nerves when you factor in all the things that could go wrong between the time you shoot the film and the time you see it, especially when it's uh, sitting in your refrigerator. And uh, this would be the restaurant I worked in. And Kimberly Page, uh, just a very intelligent, uh, totally down-to-earth young lady. The funny thing about this shot, I remember stringing these lights up behind her and lighting all these candles and then saying to Gabe, uh, I would uh, severely doubt that anyone's going to be looking at the background. Let's, uh, let's roll film. And take a good look at this alley, because if there were any scenes that required to be filmed in an alley, they were all filmed here. Uh, apparently, though I didn't know at the time, I had film in my camera as well. Gabe Sabloff. I got a roll of these photos. And geez, so many little details uh, to work out. Um, all of which are really only going to be on screen for about half a second. Uh, this room, for example, was just a white room that I dressed with red wrapping paper. And while all these details take time to make, uh, if they're really done right, the audience doesn't give them a second thought. Here we are, trespassing at UCLA. And I'll tell you, I was more worried about getting a parking ticket than I was about trespassing, because there's no room in the budget for a parking ticket. Uh, these are the actual numbers, uh, which total under 18000 and all the money I pulled together via restaurant tips and credit cards. You'll notice that uh, nearly $4,000 worth of stuff was returned, and I can tell you that I pretty much know the return policy of every clothing, furniture, and hardware store in Southern California.
Oh, and here we are trespassing on a parking garage in Westwood. And when you trespass with an actor, you gotta have your stuff together. So Gabe and I, we go over the boards, we know the setup of the shot. And as planned, this shot is supposed to start with a whip pan. However, uh, this was the first shot we filmed with Kimberly, and once she pulled off her coat and hit her pose, Gabe and I were both somewhat uh, distracted. Though eventually, five takes later, we, uh, we remembered the whip pan and made a silent vow to never get caught in her trance again. Now, unless you're into comics, you wouldn't know from the trailer that Barbara Grayson is also Batgirl. However, I really didn't feel it was essential to get that point across in the preview. And while I've seen comic books allude to a love affair between Robin and Batgirl, I wanted to take the relationship to uh, an entirely other level. Bella was a, a real pleasure to have on the set, just full of smiles. And she'd always say, okay, John Fiorella. You know, and it wasn't John, not Johnny, uh, not Mr. Fiorella, but okay, John Fiorella. Very cute. Can you really put on a black leather glove without pretending you're Darth Vader? Uh, I don't think it's possible. Oh, this was no easy task. Forget the fact that we had to sneak into some people's yards to plug in our extension cords and thieve some electricity. Uh, but Ian had to match his speed to the speed of the car, and that with the spilling of the money, and it all had to happen within this narrow sliver of light. Uh, I tell you, it's, it's a wonder he didn't get run over in this shot. As for the cops, uh, these guys were something. Kofi... I had directed previously, and he's a real fun guy, a real talented actor. As for the other cop, that's right, it's Officer Jamie. And uh, these guys were too much. I tell them, you know, lay low. We don't have permits, so I'm not looking for any attention here. Next thing I know, they're sitting out in front of this Mexican restaurant, and, and the waitress is bringing these guys free drinks because she thinks they're on the job. I'll tell you. Oh, and this was not smart. This jump was a good 30 feet above the street with no net. Just not smart. Brian Bethel. The face of evil. Actually, Brian's a nice guy. He uh, submitted a headshot for a commercial I directed two years prior, and I kept it because I knew that if I ever did a Batman-related film, that uh, this guy was my Joker. And I know for a fact that he thought I was nuts for coloring his headshot in with markers. But once he agreed to do the project, that was my official green light to get this film rolling. And all these shots were filmed in my building complex. In fact, nearly all the exterior shots were filmed where I parked my car, or in this case, on top of my car. The gun flashes were a simple effect, something I had done in a previous film. Just a strobe light I picked up from Radio Shack and set in the foreground. As for the bullet ricochets, uh, those are merely fireworks that are nailed to a wooden board. Of course, uh, there's no yelling cut when you light those things, so you're at the mercy of the fireworks. Again, uh, Gabe and I did this effect in college, so I knew we could pull this off. The Joker girls uh, were not exactly ninjas. In fact, they were a pair of waitresses I worked with, and so to make them look skilled, in the art of combat, we just broke everything down into simple moves that everyone could handle. You can uh, sort of make out that Jamie and I are lying on the steps here as corpses. And it wouldn't be the last time I had to double for a corpse in this film. And uh, what's a great Batman comic without your classic bruised up hero scene? Again, this is filmed where I park my car and the doors are just big cardboard boxes uh, being pulled in opposite directions spray-painted cardboard boxes. Oh, that's lame. Come on. We shot this scene in two different buildings because we got kicked out of the big boardroom. Though, through the magic of editing, it's all one office. Notice the uh, little tribute to Han Solo on the back wall there? Could I stick the arrow into the target? Again, this was filmed in my apartment complex, and rain is a tricky beast, and it's cold. I mean, after an hour of this, Paul was shivering, and you know, I had to tell him no shivering. Superman does not shiver. 
comics and a movie about comic book heroes, it just seemed to make sense to me. I mean, they are legends. Um, we shot this in Westwood, but I had to acquire the metal stand from another shop. And while I'm not the kind of guy who keeps his comics wrapped in plastic, it's not every day I throw my collection into the street. Superman rocks. The stepping out of the shadows. Uh, I've done this in other films. It's totally Spielberg inspired. Just right out of Raiders. Uh, the old uh, trampoline effect, uh, which is not all that impressive or safe when you think about diving 12 feet and trying to land on these swimming pool rafts. As for Superman's costume, it was just something I pieced together. Same with the Penguin's outfit. Though the purple of his hat and tie are really orange, I couldn't find a purple bow tie, so I had to spray paint them orange and key them out in post. And what are we doing here? And, uh, sure. Obviously, we only got one shot at this, and we realized as it was burning that the fire wasn't performing like it did in backdraft, so I just blew on it, and the effect was not half bad. This scene is lifted from a Batman comic called The Killing Joke, and uh, we shot this in my apartment, first with Brian doing his close-up, and then uh, at a later date with Anthony Hartley subbing in for the uh, wide shot. Afterwards, I got out the cherry pie filling and made Gloria look all beat up for this torture scene, but the uh, following day I decided to give the Joker some scarier hands, so this had to get cut. Oh, sure, skipping with mommies, no problem. Then uh, stick her with the scary clown, and suddenly, uh, can't skip any more. Uh. We uh, originally tried to shoot this at the farmer's market on 2nd Street, but we got thrown out of there and went in search of places where there were kids we could use as background. Now there's Mr. Gabe Sabloff. Um, and to do this headbutt, we were short a cameraman, so I had to turn the camera on and off. Uh, if you look to the left, you'll see my cape being thrown in the air, which really adds to the momentum of the hit, I think. Oh, here's a classic shot. Honestly, I loved when Sam Raimi had Spider-Man do this in the first Spider-Man movie, and I said, if he's having Spider-Man pull a Superman, then we've got to have our Superman pull a Superman. Oh, and this shot I, I absolutely love, because there's Gabe in the corner talking to absolutely no one. <laughs> That's just great. This was a lot of fun, too, because when you break the scene into so many little pieces, you aren't necessarily acting with other actors, you're just acting towards the camera. And the performances come so much easier when there's someone to play off of. And uh, my hallway's still a little sticky from this shot. There's the old throw-your-own-cape-in-the-air technique. Thank you very much. And yeah, I could never forget the look on Jamie's face when he came home from work and found a real flesh and blood Wonder Woman sitting in our living room, just reading a magazine, waiting to shoot her scene. And that would be me dressed as some random cop, and I don't think we could have filmed this on a windier day. You'll see some non-white skin here in just a second. Oh! Now, this is the work of Susan Huang. Uh, here she is doing a makeup test on my cousin David, and uh, she really did a great job, uh, especially having only $45 worth of makeup supplies, and uh, it's just awesome. Real collaborative person to work with. You see that thing in the background, that metal thing? That's the Archimus, and uh, you'll be seeing that uh, later. That's Gabe the Gymnast. Now, you probably noticed that uh, Kimberly Page never appears in the Catwoman costume, and the uh, reason behind that was I didn't have the time or budget to rival the costume that Tim Burton and his design team created for Michelle Pfeiffer. So I kept her in street clothes, very little street clothes, but uh, nonetheless. Once again, all this was shot in that same alley. And uh, uh, Gloria's not all that well-versed in beating up thugs, but... Uh, between smiles, she uh, she did just fine. And that thug is once again Ian Hannon, and uh, you know there's no glory in being a faceless street thug who gets clocked in the throat, but he's uh, one of those actors who really gets involved and wants to help out and uh, made a big difference. 
in the event that you were driving in Century City, uh, just cruising down Avenue of the Stars, and you think you may have seen Robin leaping between the buildings, well, uh, you weren't seeing things. I don't know how we didn't get arrested for the shoot, because it's impossible to keep under the radar when you're wearing a cape and you're carrying a trampoline in one hand and a raft in the other. But uh, somehow we lucked out. Arkham Asylum. Or Gabe's apartment building. Take your pick. Now this took some extra effort because uh, I'm the cop forcing Mark down into the chair and uh, he, well... Let's just say he wasn't getting the direction that I was laying out there. Um, so I opted for some pretty harsh comments that I think pushed him further from pretending to be mad to uh, being mad. And the end result was, uh, was great. Oh my goodness. There's Batman again, and uh, you know who that is, Cousin Jamie. This shot was conceived because I found this mirror out by the dumpster, and story-wise, I wanted to make people wonder if, in fact, Batman had uh, really been killed. So we get a glimpse of him here, or, or what some may interpret as a flashback, or even a dream. And uh, as it turns out, the mirror didn't smash, but the bottles sure did, and man, what a mess. And uh, who better to exhume than the greatest detective of all time? That is, uh, assuming that's really him. <laughs> and for my money, if you're going to stack the odds against your main character, there's no bigger underdog, there's no greater Goliath than uh, pitting Robin versus Superman. And uh, this shoot was outrageous because we had a good-sized crowd watching us film this. And, and it was awesome. Here we are, two cool guys dressed like superheroes, battling on the beach. And, well, that was all great until Gabe had to go reload the film. Suddenly, without the camera around, here we are, two scary grown men dressed in tights and hanging out on the beach. That is not a normal thing. Ah, the balloons. 420 balloons. This was in lieu of a location that canceled, and knowing that Gabe was driving down to shoot for the weekend, I came up with this set on the spot. And you'll notice here, I'm acting in slow motion, and it's really apparent when the camera is rolling at regular speed. Dork. Uh, equally dorky. Uh, thankfully, a little camera motion saved this shot. And on the flip side, we couldn't get Anthony out of character, uh, which wouldn't have been so bad if we had a trailer to send him to, because, you know, instead we got this crazy Chief O'Hara walking around all day. And that's, once again, Gabe doing the reckless roll across the cement. Of course, I fill in for the glamour shot. Yeah, it's not bad having an acrobat for a cinematographer. You probably didn't even see this in the film. Uh, this goes by so quickly, but here I am running down the street in downtown Los Angeles. Keep in mind, Gabe's filming from the car, and people on the street, they don't see the camera. They just see Robin sprinting down the sidewalk. And, and the boots, heavy like you cannot imagine, $200 boots, the most expensive shoes I've ever purchased. Hell, I, I don't own a $200 suit, but I got these things sitting in my closet. That's, uh, that's money well spent. Here we go again with forced perspective, and reason being, I didn't want to rely on doing things digitally. Uh, as it is, there's only four digital effects in the film. Uh, and I think what makes this shot work is the giant piece of cardboard that's out of frame and casting Superman in shadow. Uh, also, you'll notice you never see Superman below the knee, because I didn't want to shell out the cash for yet another pair of Rockstar boots. And the close-up we did at a local garage, uh, my car went on the lift and with a little camera motion, you know, it gives the effect. We shot this in the LAX tunnel because I needed a lot of light and the wall creates the illusion of speed. For safety, we did this at 5 in the morning and the surrounding cars are my drivers. But uh, any way you look at it, this could have proved disastrous on a lot of levels. And I know my father is going to have a sit down with me about this one. On a lighter note, you're witnessing the worst left punch ever thrown in film history. Oh, that's bad. 
Still, I love this scene. It's elbow cousin Jamie in the face, punch cousin David in the jaw, and get tackled by roommate. And this is a pretty popular street in L.A. called the 405 Freeway. Oh, man. And here we are back at the studio, or what the other tenants call the parking garage. Oh, you gotta love the Green Lantern. His suit is really just a wetsuit outfitted with some green felt. And uh, this is great because, once again, I'm directing via my back, and the actor can't see anything through the mask. You know, real science going on here. Brian pulling a fake lever, and uh, me just kneeling out of frame. Oh, this is good. That's the pool in my apartment complex, and to make this work, I needed to fashion an underwater submersible. Uh, my first attempt was not very well thought out. I simply converted the case I built for the Robin costume into a watertight container. The uh, Kleenex box, we called it. However, uh, it collapsed under the water pressure. So uh, that's when I went to work on the Archimus, which was two garbage cans that were bolted together and outfitted with uh, plexiglass windows. And uh, we had to strap about 350 pounds of weight to actually submerge it. Uh, still, the water pressure was so strong that Jamie and Anthony had to bear hug this thing uh, in order to keep it from bending out of proportion and crushing Gabe uh, inside it. Uh, then I just simply grabbed the chains, took a running leap, uh, and hoped I landed in the right spot. And honestly, this, uh, this was a lot of fun. Jeez, I hate to uh, ruin this for you kids, but you know who this Superman is? It's Super Jamie. Jeez, I, uh, I still owe Jamie big for this one. Again, here we are in uh, my parking space doing the Legends of the Fall step in front of Anthony Hopkins shot. You can see uh, that we had to duct tape the hose to the balcony railing because we were short an extra hand. And this is all Brian. Oh, yeah, that still excites me. Last but not least, uh, we actually filmed this on my birthday. My father came out to visit and brought with him this giant grinder so we could uh, create those sparks in the background. Uh, naturally, we did this in my parking space and. Man, that grinder was loud. All the neighbors uh, were big fans of this shoot. Oh my. Yeah, I put the smoke machine to work. Maybe a little too much smoke. But uh, we, we took a time out for some uh, birthday cake. Man, that was a good cake. Anyways, I hope that uh, answered a few questions. Maybe gave you a good laugh. And, well, who knows? Let's, uh, let's see where this leads.